Good evening, my friends. I was just uh, having a moment listening to a song that I heard for the first time back in 1995. I'm gonna share it at the end of our time tonight so you can hear it as well. But it's written by a composer by the name of Don Moen. And it's called, I Just Wanna Be Where You Are. It's a beautiful worship song and that's what I was listening to. I got a little distracted. But he actually did an entire musical called God With Us. And tonight we are going to be in this prayer that Jesus prayed to his Father. We are going to be in the presence of God tonight. I hope you'll join us. Um, say hello when you get on. I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for sharing these words in John chapter 17, that you have given us insight into a relationship between the Father and the Son, and the beautiful, beautiful demonstration that Jesus gave us while he was here on earth, fully God and fully man, and his recognition of the fact that he needed to be where you are in daily, constant communion with you in order for him to do the things that you called him to do. And it's the same for us. Pray that you would just uh, minister through your word tonight, through John chapter 17, as we take a few moments and spend some time in this, your last prayer before you suffer. We will give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Kim. Hi, Jim. Yes, John chapter 17. Let's set the stage a little bit. So as we've mentioned before, this is all a continual thing. There's just chapter markings. But just prior to this, Jesus and his 12 disciples had met in an upper room in Jerusalem where they enjoyed a Passover feast together. During that feast, Jesus washed the feet of all 12 of his disciples. He gave them some teaching. He gave them some encouragement, some admonishment, some things that they needed to be looking out for. And then towards the end of the time, he told Judas, Iscariot, go and do what you're going to do and Judas left. So now we're left with Jesus and his 11 disciples. He said, okay, let's wrap it up. Let's go from here. And they were going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. As they're walking along the road, he gives them this uh, image of the vine and the branches and the vine dresser. God the Father is the vine dresser. Jesus is the true vine, and we are the branches. And the only way that we bear fruit is if we are abiding in the vine, in Jesus. And at the end of chapter 16, things were getting a little bit tense. Jesus was telling them that things were going to happen, that they were going to, they were about to scatter and leave him, abandon him. They didn't believe it, but he said, this is what's gonna happen. He said, but it's okay, I'm not going to be alone. You will have tribulation in this world. You will have tribulation in this world, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So those were the last words that were said prior to this next passage in John chapter 17. Jesus then spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do, and now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. Oh, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name, those whom you have given to me, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none, none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, 
I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So those are the first 19 verses. So the first portion of this, Jesus is praying, the first five verses, he's praying for himself. But it's very specific. What kinds of things does he pray about for himself? Well, he starts out by asking the Father to glorify him. But why? Because he wanted to be center stage? No. Glorify me so that I can glorify you. That is the only time we should ever want any kind of attention, is just so we can put it back on the Father. Walk in the light so that they might see our good words and glorify not us, but our Father in heaven. Jesus then acknowledged that he had done the job that God had sent him to do. And what was that? Jesus came to this earth to demonstrate who God is so the disciples could have eternal life. Now, a moment break here about this word eternal life. I don't know about you, but a lot of times I think when we as Christians think about eternal life, we think about what happens after we die. But in reality, our eternal life begins the moment we come to Christ. That is our new eternal life. We are with him. He is with us. Jesus praised those very words later on here in this, in this chapter. I want them to be one, just as you and I are one. Now the question comes to mind, maybe, why did Jesus even pray? I mean, Jesus is God, and there's God the Father and God the Son, but if Jesus is fully God, then why did he have to pray? Why did he feel the need to pray? He prayed a lot, if you'll remember. All throughout the scriptures, Jesus was constantly going off by himself to pray. And sometimes he prayed all night. Sometimes he got up early and went out into the wilderness and he prayed by himself. Prior to his incarnation, Jesus had been one in the presence of the Father. Once he became incarnate and he took on the robe of flesh, he now was, he was still fully God, but he was fully man. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 10 explain that a little bit better. We're told, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself to death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess, both those on the earth, above the earth, and below the earth, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So he was fully God, but he was still fully man. And he was, he had this unusual, weird sort of physical separation from his father, but he knew that in order for him to do the things that God, the Father, had called him to do, he needed constant communion with the Father. Doesn't it bear to seem to make sense that we would also need that? I think he's leaving us a perfect example of how we are supposed to enable, be enabled to do the things God has called us to do. If we are not in communion with the Father, if we are not spending time in the Word, in prayer, asking the Father to make himself known to us through his Word, and asking the Holy Spirit to help us to interpret the words on a page, how can we ever hope to have the power that we have been promised and we have been given? Hey, Gerald, good to see you here, man. And Joanne, thanks for, thanks for joining us. So Jesus is giving us an example, in addition to doing it because he knew he needed it. He needed that communion with his Father. And he asked the Father, Lord, Father God, I want to be where you are. I'm ready to come home. I'm ready for our oneness to be restored. Glorify me through what's about to happen so that I can in turn glorify you. He's basically asking the Father, I'm ready. Take me home. I know I've got to go through this horrible horrible crucifixion and suffering and rejection by these people who are with me now, who claim they will never leave me, and that they are my disciples and my followers forever. I know that's not going to be true, but Father God, I need you to help me through this so that I can continue to honor you in what I'm doing. The next prayer, section of his prayer, from verses 6 to 19, he's praying for these 11 men who have been with him for three years. He's asking, what is he asking God the Father to do for his disciples? He asks them, asks for them to be given his joy. 
He asks for them to be given love for one another and a unity of spirit, just like he has with the Father. Can you imagine what level of unity that is? I, I guess there are instances when I have felt that level of unity with other believers, but our humanness gets in the way, doesn't it? Where we might, we're, we're constantly kind of juggling between our wants and our needs and our desires and the things that we agree or disagree about, a lot of them very, very petty. Jesus prays for his disciples that they would have unity, joy, love for one another. He asks the Father to sanctify them. That word sanctify just means set them apart for this special purpose that you have laid out to them. You gave them to me. They were a gift from the Father. Yes, they made a choice. They chose to follow Jesus. But God, in turn, gave them to his Son. So Jesus is thankful for these men who have been with him, and he asks God, sanctify them just as you are sanctifying me, and keep me and keep them for the purpose that they're placed here for. Some people get hung up on this whole chosen before the world began, and as an example, um, Ephesians 1 through through 6, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, you know, there are, we humans, we like to put things in one school of thought or the other, and we have a hard time seeing a blend between the two of them, but there are two truths that are equally true. He chose us before the foundation of the world, but he also gave us free will. So we, in turn, then still have to make the decision to choose him. So if you want to argue about being chosen, chosen, it's in the scripture. It's Maybe you don't like it. Maybe it, it rubs you the wrong way, but it's tr truth nonetheless. But that doesn't negate the fact that he chose us, but we still choose him. It's a mystery, but it's true. He uses this term in the world an awful lot in this passage. When he, when he talks about that in the world, are we talking about just, you know, the fact that they're standing on the planet Earth? The world in this sense that he's using it is the current environment or the cosmos or the, the way things are in our current world. Throughout the scriptures, Satan is described as being the ruler of this world. All of the weird things that go on in this life, on this world, in this, on this planet, during this time, this is the world. But Jesus says, they are not in the world even as I am not in the world, of the world rather. We are in the world, but not of the world. So Jesus called his disciples out of the worldly life that they were all in. Different walks of life, a tax collector, lots of fishermen, later on a doctor, a woman, many women actually. Um, but he called these people from their earthly walks of life, from their worldly lives. He called them out of that. Then he sanctified them. He taught them. He ministered to them and he shared with them the things that the Father told him to tell them. You see, Jesus came so that we could know the Father because the Father and the Son are one, but the Son had flesh on him. We beheld his glory but we could see him and touch him, we being the disciples. We could hear him, hear his words, hear his voice, share a meal with him, have our feet washed by him. He was a human, but he was still fully God. But Jesus, when he said he had done the work he'd been sent to do, he had. He had shared with these men exactly who his father was, exactly why he had come, even though they didn't understand it before his crucifixion, and they really wouldn't get it until 
after his resurrection, he made it clear to them. He gave them the Holy Spirit. He brought to their remembrance all the things that they wrote. Can you imagine? All these words that we read in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit brought them back to the remembrance, not only to the remembrance so they could remember the words, but that they could now finally understand them and know why they had been told all those things and what they all meant. And he does the same thing for us. We just have to ask. He has given us his Holy Spirit to allow us to be able to read in his word, ask him to explain it to us, to make it real to our hearts and to apply it to our lives. So he has taken these disciples out of the world, taught them, and now he is putting them back in the world so that they could minister and share the gospel. He said, you're going to do far greater works than I have ever done. By that, he meant, I believe, sharing the gospel message with thousands, the whole world almost at this point in time has heard of Jesus. I'm sure there are still pockets in the world that haven't, but as soon as the last people group has heard, whoosh, I believe we're out of here. So he has sent them into the world, but they are in the world and not of the world, and the same is true for us. It's not easy though, is it? Have you ever been in a situation where you were, felt like you were the only person in spitting distance who believed the way you believe, who believed that Jesus really was God, that everything in the Bible is true, and people around you look at you like you're a nut. But we are in this world to share and spread the light. That's why we're still here. We've talked before, when the rapture occurs, the Holy Spirit who lives in us is taken out. We are out of here and they, the people that are left no longer have our witness. So we must do everything we can to be witnesses of the truth and the gospel and to share his light, to be in the world, but not of the world. The world needs us, but I read a, listened to a sermon um, earlier this week. He said, not only does the world need us, but we kind of need the world. And I'm like, what? And he told this story, and I've actually heard this before. When the um, codfish uh, that are no normally captured in the Northwest, in the cold waters of the Pacific, they wanted to get them to market on the East Coast. So the first time they tried to ship them across the country, they caught the fish, they cleaned the fish, they packed them in ice, and they shipped them across the country in trucks. Well, by the time they got to the destination, they were tasteless. They were just bleh. Like, okay, maybe it's because we cleaned them and they had all this time to travel. Let's ship them live across the country. So they put them in these big saltwater tanks, in these big trucks, and they shipped them across the country. And then when they got to the destination, then they killed them and cleaned them and served them. But they were mushy. They they were, they, a cod is normally a very firm fish. And somebody had the great idea, you know what keeps them firm is, you know, they, they have to get away from predators. What if we put the predator in the tank with them so the whole time while they're traveling across the country, they're having to, they're having to work. They're having to swim around and get away from the catfish, which is their natural predator. So they did that, and guess what? The cod were tasty when they got there. Maybe a strange story, but I believe that the, the trials that we face in this world are meant for a purpose. If we don't ever have to struggle, then we never grow. We've talked about this before. If we want to build muscle, we need resistance, whether it's a weight or a band. If we need to grow spiritual muscle, then we need challenges. We need trials and the world that we are in provides that, and it only works if we allow it to make, to make us better and not bitter. Yes, things are hard. Yes, horrible things happen. We lose people. We get sick. We get injured. We lose finances. We lose fill in the blank. We have struggles, temptations, trials, addictions, any, any number of things. But those working through those struggles with the help of the Holy Spirit and with the help of God is what strengthens us. Because if we were just lounging around being sofa spuds and not having to work 
at anything, then we become lazy and we become useless. We need to be salt and light, and in order to do that, sometimes that means that we have to struggle. The last part of this prayer, interestingly enough, starting in verse 20, just these last few verses, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying for us. He's about to go through the most horrific, cruel death. And what is on his heart and mind? He wants to glorify his Father. He wants to sanctify and protect and, and embolden and empower his disciples. And he even prayed for you and me. He's praying that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I've given them. He's given you, that they may be one, just as we are one. Verse 23, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. How many times does he say he wants us to experience that same level of oneness that he and the Father shared? Do you think that's possible on this side of the veil that we call life? I think we get glimpses of it, but once again, I think we get it. We're our own worst enemies, and we get the way. But this whole prayer, Father, I want them to be where I am. And that's the promise. It's not just after death, though, that we are with him. We are with him and he is with us anytime we choose to be. Anytime we devote ourselves to prayer and study and fellowship with believers and worship. For me, worship through music is the most powerful. I told you at the beginning of this, I was listening to a song written by Don Moen, called, I Just Want to Be Where You Are. Let me read the first few few words from that song. It's, I've been listening to this whole musical called God With Us that we sang at my church back in 1995 when I was going through a very challenging time in my life. Another huge, huge loss in my life that I was grieving terribly. And I remember standing on stage for four services, singing these songs with tears streaming down my face, Pretty much every service. But this song, I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence, feasting at your table and surrounded by your glory. In your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. That song, I Just Want to Be Where You Are, and that whole musical, God With Us, God Will Make a Way, is another amazing song in that whole, we used to call it a cantata, so there's some narration in between it, but I'm going to post it in here after we get off, um, off the live stream. This entire, Don Bowen has recently released this entire concert for free on YouTube, and it's about 35 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, with these songs back to back, it is just such a beautiful, beautiful worship experience. And you get to hear some of the stories about how he was inspired to write these pieces. And you get to hear him singing them along with choir and orchestra. And it's just, I have been going to sleep listening to this. I actually bought the CD, but I've been listening to this probably for the last four weeks, nonstop, almost every night as I go to sleep. Sometimes I play it on repeat. And I just listen to it over and over and over again. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. And on that note, I want to share a praise. Today, one of the things that I've been had on my plate of things to do was we have this fancy schmancy 
um, Chevy Traverse that's outfitted with a ramp, a motorized ramp, and it raises and lowers and for wheelchair access. Well, with Mal gone now, I don't need it, and I really wanted to make it available to someone who could use it. But it's really hard to price because it's basically it was a brand new vehicle, and then the chassis was replaced, and all these electronics and things were added to it, and seats were torn out and added and all that. And the sticker price on this thing, once they did all those modifications, was like almost $90,000. Now, praise God, the VA and a couple of charitable organizations helped us get that vehicle. And so so it's, it's mine outright, and I did pay a dime for it. But it is an asset, and I'm a steward. But I didn't want to just sell it. You know, I call dealerships that deal with wheelchair vehicles, and, and I really wanted to sell it to someone who could use it, and I was hoping that they would connect me with a buyer. But the dealerships all just want to buy it wholesale, low dollar, buy it wholesale, jack up 20% on it, and then sell it to somebody. Well, that didn't feel right to me. Um, but they wouldn't connect me with an individual person who needed it. Well, long story short, the company and the organization that helped us get into this vehicle contacted me and said, we have a young man in our shop. He's probably in his 20s. Um, he needs a very high-end um, solution for his driving needs, and it's going to be very expensive, but he really likes the Chevy Traverse. Would you be interested in selling it to him? And I was like, absolutely. I will sell it to him at the wholesale price, knowing that he's going to get the best use out of it, and he's raising funds through various means. He's um, been disabled since birth. Um, anyways, today, I drove down to Quantico. I took the vehicle down there, and it just turned over 10,000 miles when I was coming home. But I met this young man and his mother and his stepfather and was able to bring them on board and show them how everything worked. And, you know, it's all the warranties are still good. It only has 10,000 miles on it. His van had 100,000 miles on it. So God just worked it all out. And I believe that by the end of this month, he's going to have the vehicle that he needs. And I'm going to be able to then turn around and get something that I can use because my vehicle is a 2005. <laughs> and I could use maybe something a little bit more up to date uh, for security purposes and for just longevity. But that is a huge, huge praise. So thank you for your prayers for me as going through. That's just one little thing that God has been demonstrating to me that he will make a way. Even when there seems to be no way, he works in ways he cannot see. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you that you work in ways we cannot see. That you loved us right to the very end. That the thing that was on your mind as you were facing the most horrific death, you were thinking of us and your disciples. You were praying for us, praying that we would know your joy and your peace and your love and the same level of unity that you have with the Father. Thank you, Lord, for sanctifying us, for making us holy to you. Just pray that you would give us the motivation and the the fortitude to stay in your word, to dwell daily in your presence, and to live this eternal life, even on this side of the veil, knowing that we can be with you right here on earth. Thank you for this group, for this time together, for your word, for the way that you provide for us. Now I just ask that you would go with us as we go our separate ways and give us peaceful rest. For it's the matchless name of Jesus Christ, your son, that I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And thank you again for your continued prayers and your notes of encouragement. I just hope you all have a great week ahead. And uh, take care. And God bless.